Are you ready for some championship basketball today, guys? I know the Fordham Rams are. Welcome back to the channel and to the series, everyone. My name is College Sports Revived, and here in episode number 58 of our College Hoops 2K Legacy Mode, Coach Carter's Fordham Rams are vying for their first ever A-10 championship in not only our tenure here, but in the history of the Fordham Rams since joining the conference back in 1991. And waiting in the other locker room is an old rival of ours. The three-seeded George Washington Revolutionaries will be our opponents, a team that we've had some battles against over the years, but also a team that we've been out playing in our last few meetings. So it was far from a cakewalk for the Rams to get to this point, though. We knew coming into the tournament that it would be a, uh, a tough trip to the title game. And immediately the Temple Owls gave us that challenge we were preparing for. Despite only six conference wins, they came ready to play lengthening the game down to one possession where the coach's kid, Damian Carter, drew a shooting foul with three seconds to go and sunk the game-winning free throw to send us to round two. And surprisingly, the semifinal game against the 16th ranked Dayton Flyers was a little less strenuous. Thanks to possibly our best offensive game we've ever played in this series, the Rams advanced the championship game behind a 10-point win. And now only one more game stands between us and tasting that champagne. The 26-win George Washington Revs are also ready for a chance at the title behind the motivation of their three key seniors. And there's plenty of reason to think that they can do it. And as you can see in these box scores, George Washington, a lot of their offensive income comes from the front court. Definitely a, uh, a different tune than we've seen recently from the teams we faced. But in our only meeting this year, Fordham blew out the Revs by 18, and that further adds to Fordham's winning ways against GWU recently. But that was only one of four conference losses for the Revs this season. They finished in that four-way tie for first place with Fordham. But we had the tiebreaker, obviously, but that hasn't stopped them from winning nine in a row entering today, including wins over St. Joe's, St. Louis, and Dayton in that stretch. And if you watch this series for a couple years now, these are names that shouldn't be foreign to you as we look at their roster. Terea Snell, uh, Steph Baptiste, two of the best big men in the league for years now. Snell's the offensive guru. He's had a monster A-10 tournament, as you saw in those box scores. As for Steph Baptiste, his defensive numbers don't jump off the page at you like they used to, but this is still a guy who averaged over two blocks a game before. Their senior point guard, Zach Yates, he's been around for a long time as well, so they have three fan favorites that have plenty of motivation to change their recent rows against the Rams and go off on a high note. But with our first ever recruiting class of Dustin Black, Chen Li, and others graduating as well, we feel that same motivation, and we're gonna try to fulfill our one seed billing and win our first regular season and conference crown both in the same year. Buckle up guys, this should be a good one. Rams and Revs, their elite front court against our elite back court. Can Lloyd Hicks slow down Torreya Snell? Let's find out here as we tip it off and the A-10 championship has arrived guys. It's fine, we get off and running here in the first half. And as tradition here in these one game episodes, we're going to watch the first offensive possession of both sides. Lloyd Hicks draws plenty of attention against the zone of GWU, but Kai Hendry, I like the aggressiveness, but couldn't get the shooter's touch to go down for him. Damian Carter, though, picks the pocket of Zach Yates, and immediately the underclassman gets one up on the senior point guard. That's what I'm talking about. That's how you throw a haymaker here in the biggest game of the season. And no surprise that Damian Carter might have a little extra pep in his step here in the championship round after being the hero in the quarterfinal game with that game-winning free throw. Lloyd Hicks now challenging Torreya Snell, their first one-on-one -on -one battle. It looked like it was about to go Torreya Snell's way. He got a piece of it, almost got the steal, but Lloyd Hicks picks it up, goes right at him, and gets two there inside. So we get a stop, and now we're trying to retake the lead. Bennett Pinkala showing off some nice vision here. Kaya Hendry, the right corner, serves him a little bit better than the left. And Bennett Pinkala, I gotta talk about his playmaking a little bit here. We had arguably our best offensive game, not only this season, but perhaps the entire series against Dayton in the semis. And I think Bennett Pinkala was a big reason for that. He had a team high five assists in that one. And Pat Park continues the defensive pressure out on the perimeter. He goes up and slams one down. That's what I'm talking about, man. Got to get out, got to run against this team. They're going to try to muck it up in the half court with that zone and pack it in and force you to beat them. 
by really being methodical on the offensive end. But if we can get out, play great defense, and run and avoid that, then that's exactly what we got to do. That's kind of what we've been doing in these last couple meetings against the Revs. This used to be a pretty prolific rivalry, but we've taken the last three meetings dating back to Season 3 against the Revs. But check out Torreya Snow. He's dishing it back to Lloyd Hickster with the three-point play. Revs back out on top. But yeah, so this dominance against the Revs, it kind of all started back in Season 3's conference tournament whenever we were an underdog against the Revs. Check out this, though. Damian Carter, three-point play, slicing and dicing, dishing and swishing. Oh, man, the sophomore is off to a hot start. Had that opening layup. Now he gets one here after breaking the ankles of multiple GWU defenders. So the Fordham Rams trying to make it four in a row against the Revs. Dating back to that Season 3 Conference Tournament, we upset the Revs in a blowout. And they were just one of the victims in our path making the Conference Championship game that season. Check out Torreya Snell, though, from the short corner. He's so gifted offensively. 16.5 points, 6.5 rebounds averaged on his senior year. Those numbers definitely helped with his 23.5 points and 10 rebounds averaged in the two games here in the A-10 tournament. He's also shot 27 free throws in those two games. Nice pass there, though, by Zach Yates. As the Colonials trying to take control of this game. The layup gave him a four-point advantage, and now it's up to six thanks to a pretty uncharacteristic mistake there by Pat Park. Lazy off of the inbound, and they take advantage with the deflection and the layup. Damian Carter, he's got the keys to the offense right now. He's our top scorer with eight out of our 20. Man, what has gotten into Damian? And now it's Dustin Black checking in and getting the steal. Let's see if we can make something of it, though. 6.40 left to go, down by five here in the A-10 championship. Both of these uh, teams projected around a six seed in March Madness right now in the later projected brackets. Chen Li from the elbow, 15 feet out. Perfect zone offense right there. You get the ball to the middle. And that's when good things happen, especially when Steph Baptiste and Torreya Snell are both off the floor. But right as I say that, they both check in with three minutes left to go. As they're starting to feel the pressure of relinquishing this lead. They get the stop there, though. And Reese Acasio, one of the better shooters, finds Torreya Snell again for the baby jumper. Man, these guys have been going back and forth a little bit. Snell and Lloyd Hicks, two gifted offensive big men who have been not giving an inch on either end. Torreya Snell 4 for 5 on the game, but is Lloyd Hicks going to try to answer back? Well, let's see, he sets a screen here for Dustin Black, and he misses the layup, though. These revolutionaries can definitely have the ability to defend the rim a lot better than the teams we've been facing recently. It's definitely something to get used to here. Zach Yates, corner tray ball. Really nice possession there for the Revs, and now they're back up to a six-point game, tying their largest lead of the contest. But I know Kaya Hendry and company not going to stand for that for too long. How about Lloyd Hicks? He's now four for five, matching his counterpart, uh, Lloyd Hicks, man, and Torreya Snow. That matchup has been all as advertised. 36-34 Revs, eight-second difference between the two game clocks. I've really liked our zone offense today, and here on the final possession of the first half, that would continue. Dustin Black with seven off the bench. You know the first recruit in serious history to come ready to play here in this one. Two seconds. One second. That one's blocked on the other end. Kaya Hendry out of nowhere for a huge rejection. He had one last game as well. How about two huge blocks here? in the A-10 playoffs for Kai Hendry. And we go into the halftime uh, report with the lead, 37-36 with Damian Carter, out of all players, being our leading scorer. I like the way we're running our zone offense. They're letting us live with the jumpers and we've been knocking them down. Just gotta continue to do that. We also need to continue to try to run the break, continue to force turnovers. We forced six in the first half, so that's also really good. Uh, and we also need to rebound the ball a little bit better. They are leading the rebound battle. We only have four as a team so far. I know both teams have been shooting well, but definitely got to crash a little bit harder. So 15 minutes to go, guys. Let's see if Fordham can win the first A-10 championship in school history. Fordham 41, Georgia Washington 39. A couple baskets for both sides as we check back in here. 13-20 left to play. 
And here we go, Zach Yates starting five back out on the floor for both teams. And with 20 to shoot, Zach Yates bounce pass inside to Steph Baptiste. And look at that, yet another tie game in this one. Neither side giving in as Baptiste has his second field goal of the game. 14 points average for the 6'9 senior. Steph Baptiste was actually, at one point in the series, one of the top shot blockers in the nation. I think he ended the year with 2.3 rejections in a season. And how about this ball reversal, man? We've been doing an excellent job working around the perimeter, giving everyone a touch, and also we've been doing a great job of forcing turnovers. Oh, but Pat Park, a lot of contact underneath the rim. But it looks like we're gonna have to play for the stop instead. Zach Yates trying to put the moves on Damian Carter, who stands his ground, forces the steal, and Hendry gives it to Pat Park, who again can't finish. Oh man, he left that one a little bit short. Perhaps heard the footsteps on that one. Man, can we get a bucket to fall here on the break? Steph Baptiste inside. This one he leaves short. Okay, so maybe ball doesn't lie. Maybe we'll finally finish one off. Pat Park inside. This one is too strong. So we had one should have been foul. We had one too short and one too long. So Pat Park... Definitely a little bit uncharacteristic here, uh, missing out on some opportunities inside, but yet another steal by Fordham, and Damian Carter says, you know what, I'll take it into my own hands. You can't get much more high percentage than a dunk, and Damian Carter's got 12. Timeout revs after a string of three consecutive turnovers, but they still find themselves in this game despite nine team turnovers to our five at this point. Eight minutes to play. Working it around the perimeter. It's been serving us well so far. They're just too slow on the rotations in that zone. And Damian Carter with 14, making three-fourths of his shots. Having another shooter to go along with Kaya Hendry and Pat Park's ability to make shots. It's almost unguardable in a zone. And how about this? Extra passes here. Junior to Kaya to Nick Jallo. This was a thing of beauty. Man, if our offense is playing like this entering March... Who knows what happens in this month? A seven point lead. Are we finally taking control of the A-10 championship? Lloyd Hicks gets a quick breather. So does Kai Hendry and Pat Park. Langdon for three. This one's short, but Teraya Snell on the glass. We gotta get Lloyd Hicks back in there. You can see I'm about to sub him back in because he is the only one that can keep Teraya Snell off of the offensive glass. He's Mr. Windex right now. Under five to play, Hicks back in, Junior Battle moves to the four, and let's see, he's going to draw some attention, Dustin Black, tough shot, but another one goes for the backup point guard, our PG play has been superb in this one, he and Damian Carter have combined for 25 on the night, and that has been the difference in this one, 23 ticks on this possession, plenty of time to shoot, but doesn't matter, B.J. Bradshaw still finds a way to get it done inside. He's had a nice second half. He's been one of the key guys for the Revs here in the final 15 minutes. Steph Baptiste will try his luck with the jump shot, but it's not been his night. It's been mostly Terea Snell and B.J. Bradshaw for the Revs. We're going to call a timeout. We're going to get Kai Hendry back in there and give a quick break to Damian Carter. And it's been so hard to keep Damian off the floor with how well he's been playing. He's been lights out here in the A-10 championship. Game ball goes to him, I think, if we win. And five to shoot on this possession. Bounce pass. Hendry. We need this one. But he can't extend it to a three-possession game. Rebound Bradshaw. That's Devon Engel. He's getting pressured near the timeline. Almost a mistake there. He almost goes backcourt. But the Revs will set it up. Going inside to you-know-who. Terea Snell with the left Hook, it somehow can't fall. Wow, I can't believe that one didn't drop down. Pat Park, handoff. And inside a junior battle. I don't know how Pat Park got that pass around the defense, but somehow he did. And junior battle comes off the bench to deliver two of the biggest points of his career and of our season. That's what I love most about Coach Carter and all of his legacy mode teams. He just has units with all 15 guys buying in. All 15 guys ready to play, put in a big bucket when they need to. Last episode, it was Nick Jallo, a bench player. This time, it was Junior Battle, another bench player, putting in huge points for us. Zach Yates, though, cuts the lead in half. One of the biggest shots of his career, as the Revs aren't going anywhere. They stay in the press a minute to go, trying to avoid a mistake here. 
and we do. We get it across half court, and now we can hopefully take this clock down to hopefully around 30 seconds going inside. Handoff, Kai Hendry underneath the rim. He somehow gets it to drop a little bit quicker than maybe for our liking, but we get two points regardless. And Kaya Hendry in such a rough spot there underneath the rim with two guys around him, he gets creative and somehow puts in a huge bucket. Bennett Pinkala checks back in. We need the defense out there. 12 second difference between shot clock and game clock. If the Rebs go fast, they can keep a uh, shot clock for them themselves. And that's exactly what they do. Zach Yates with another tray ball. Was that Damian Carter who fell asleep there? A huge defensive blunder off the inbound. And now that shot changes the landscape of this entire possession. Instead of Fordham just sitting it and icing the game here maybe, now they need a basket and the pressure swings to their side to try to make this a two possession ball game. 20 seconds left to play. George Washington still in the zone. Damien's trapped and turns it over. BJ Bradshaw with another crucial play. 10 seconds to go, no timeouts. BJ Bradshaw, one on one against Damien. Four seconds, kick out. Zach Yates, it's blocked. It's blocked, Pat Park seals it. Forum wins the A-10 championship. They held on. Oh man, what a finish. Pat Park's block shot saves Fordham from a potential blunder. And for the first time ever, the A-10 crown is headed back to the Bronx. It's time to celebrate, boys. Oh man, what a game. The Revs never gave in despite going down on their luck a couple times and a pretty emotional moment there as Kai Hendry and Pat Park hug each other at the timeline. Oh man, we can finally catch our breaths, man. What a game. Uh, I don't really know what happened there at the end. Somehow we held on in dramatic fashion and somehow we uh, were able to win despite not getting a great game from either Kai Hendry or Pat Park, which I think bodes well for us that we can have both of our players not have a great game and we still find a way to win. I like that a lot. Especially, you know, you could say Lloyd Hicks didn't have a great game either because he had um, zero points in the entire second half and finished with eight. That's pretty crazy. So no second half points from uh, Lloyd Hicks and both Kai Hendry and Pat Park not really on their game. You gotta expect that at least one of those two guys will have a good one. But Damian Carter gets the game ball. He's your player of the game here in the championship, along with you know guys like Nick Jallo and Dustin Black. They also deserve their fair share of credit in this one. And we can finally really soak in this achievement. Man, what a game. And you know what really gets me, guys, is as we look at the conference standings, look at the team in last place, St. Bonaventure, with three conference wins and six wins overall. If that record sounds familiar, well, it's because that was our record back in season one. We've gone from the bottom to the top in five years, and to me, it was worth every minute. Here's our final resume, winners of 8 of 10, 2-2 two two against the top 25, 13-0 at home, and an impressive 8 quad 1 wins in 10 tries, and of course, the A-10 banner up on our wall. The latest projected bracket has us to enter Marge at a 6 seed. Let's see if this title win boosts us up here on Selection Sunday. Grab your popcorn guys, let's hop into it. Hi, and welcome to 2K Sports Studios. I'm Greg Gumbel with Clark Kellogg. We're here with the 2K Sports NCAA Selection Show. We're all set to show you the seedings and pairings, so get out your bracket sheet, get those pencils ready. Here are the basics. Before we get into the brackets for the upcoming tournament, let's take a look at the final top 25 media poll. There are a couple of shakeups as we get ready for March Madness. The UNLV Running Rebels jumped all the way from the number 24 spot to number 17. Also, a new team has made the leap into the top 25. The Fordham Rams are back in the poll as the number 21 team. They're peaking at just the right time, Greg. This is exactly the way you want to be playing going into the tournament. It's time to talk about the topic that has a lot of players and coaches holding their breath right now, the NCAA tournament bubble. 
These are the 10 teams that aren't worried as much about where they'll be playing as if they'll be playing. I'm sure it's been a long week for those teams, but the wait's almost over. The NCAA Selection Committee has finished its meeting, and we're ready to unveil the top four seeds in this year's tournament. The Seton Hall Pirates are the top overall seed, and they will play in the East Regional. On to the second number one seed, who will play in the South Regional. The Louisville Cardinals are seeking their third NCAA championship in school history. The Miami Hurricanes are our third number one seed, and they'll play in the Midwest Regional. They're back in the tournament again, and no doubt they'll be feeding off the experience of last year's appearance as they try to get to the Final Four this year. And finally, our fourth number one seed will play in the West Regional. The Michigan Wolverines are in the tournament field as a number one seed for the third time in the history of their program. Now, here's how the brackets shape up based on where the number one seeds have been assigned. So, with the number one seeds out of the way, it's finally time to tackle the rest of the brackets. First up, we take a look at the East Regional. Next up, we'll take a look at the South Regional. On to our third bracket of the day. Let's take a look at the Midwest Regional. Let's have a look at the West Regional. The Michigan Wolverines are the top seed, finishing at 28 and 5. They won both the regular season and conference tournament titles in the Big Ten. They'll take on the Citadel Bulldogs, the number 16 ranked team. This marks their first appearance in the NCAA tournament in the history of their school. Next up is the number 8 seed. The Duke Blue Devils have established themselves as one of the best teams from the ACC. They'll be going up against the number 9 seed, the Massachusetts Minutemen, with 24 wins. This marks their 10th appearance in the NCAA tournament in team history. St. Louis comes in as the number 5 seed, finishing at 22 and 8. And they will take on the 12th seed from the Horizon League, the Wisconsin-Milwaukee Panthers, with 24 wins. Fordham comes in as the number four seed, finishing at 25 and seven. Army comes in to face them at number 13 with 17 wins in the tournament championship of the Patriot League. Our number six seed is from the A-10 conference. The George Washington Colonials were rewarded for their outstanding play this season with an at-large bid and a ticket to the big dance. They are going to play the number 11 seed, the Florida State Seminoles, who were eighth in their conference, finishing at 19 and 12. The Pepperdine Waves are in as the number three seed. They'll be taking on the number 14 seed, the Iowa State Cyclones, with 16 wins. And now the number seven seed, the Washington Huskies, come into the tournament as the fourth place team in their conference during the regular season and were losers in their first game at their conference tournament. They are going to play the number 10 seed, the Marshall Thundering Herd, who came in first in their conference tournament, finishing at 21 and 10. Kentucky enters the field as the number two seed from the SEC. It's yet another appearance in the brackets for a school that's no stranger to the NCAA tournament. They'll be getting ready to face the number 15 seed. On the surface, I'd have to say this regional might be the most difficult of the four. Certainly the depth of quality teams here is very impressive. Whoever emerges from this bracket will have been through some battles. Clark, how do you view this year's top 16? There are no real off the wall picks that jump out at me. These 16 teams are all pretty deserving. Let's give the committee some props this year. Now, let's bring the conference picture into focus. The ACC gets eight teams. The A-10 with seven, six out of the Pac-10. The Big East gets six teams. Now that we know all the teams and matchups, time to get the tournament underway and let the madness take over. Greg, it's going to be a fantastic tournament. We've got an outstanding field and a lot of sensational players. 
I guarantee there are some memorable moments soon to come. For my partner Clark Kellogg and for all of us here in the 2K Sports Studios, I'm Greg Gumbel. Thanks for joining us on the NCAA Selection Show, brought to you by State Farm, the number one auto insurer. Enjoy all the excitement of the NCAA tournament. Well, 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 what has happened here, guys? Fordham gets boosted up to a four seed and will play Army West Point in the first round. And if you've been around the channel for a little bit, you definitely understand why that's already pretty crazy. But then on top of that, we're going to play the winner of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and in-conference rival St. Louis. Not going to lie, I was a little bummed out to see that. The committee in real life, they avoid putting inter-conference opponents next to each other like that in the bracket to make sure there's no conference matchups until at least the Sweet 16. And on top of that, the seeding insanity continues with George Washington right under us as the sixth seed in our West Regional. We also have UMass in our region. Um, and I also thought it was crazy that Dayton got a three seed after we beat them in the semis of the A-10 tournament. I don't really know about that one. Uh, normally I'm pretty patient with the selection committee, but this year they were smoking crack or something back there. I don't really know what they were doing, but the good news is we did get a pretty good draw to make some noise. Army made a miracle run in the Patriot League. They beat the Lafayette Leopards, who went 13-1 and in league play, but nothing really jumps out about them. You know, they're 76 overall rating, they're 17 and 11 record. I like this matchup to try to finally earn our first win in school history in March. And if we beat the Black Knights, we'll play the winner of UW Milwaukee and St. Louis. And even though it's a little lame that we have to play an A-10 team probably if we win, I think it'll be pretty cool still to play a rival in March. George Washington got a tough draw. I'm sure this is going to be a popular upset pick in Florida State. St. Joe's faces Cal, who was a bubble team coming into Selection Sunday. I'm taking the Hawks in this one. Uh, Charlotte, thanks to their first round loss, they fall to an 8th seed to play Clemson. I'll still take Charlotte in this one. And the craziest one to me, what about Dayton's resume? Says they're a 3 seed, especially after we beat them by 10 to knock them out of the conference tournament. This one's a bit of a mystery to me, but I can't be you know mad or anything we can't be focused on what happened with other teams right now we got to focus on ourselves it's march guys it's time to tip things off despite the insanity that is the selection committee we should be very happy with where we are we finished the year ranked as a 21st team in the country we earned that fourth seed and we have a path to make some noise and this year's tournament the best time of the year fellas march madness that'll be coming in the next episode so stay on the lookout for that stay tuned for that and more here coming on College Sports Revived. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.